privilege to have as part of our citizen science hours, the, the previous two, uh, Genia and Lena, um, talking to us about the critically endangered spoonbill sandpiper. And uh, this evening, sadly, is to be our, uh, our last, uh, the last of three presentations. And um, uh, with a migratory shorebird, it, uh, it's obviously important that uh, conservation measures take into account the fact that uh, these birds move over vast distances. And this evening, uh, I think that the gist of the presentation is about uh, somebody with a pot on his head um, or something on his head, uh, but it's all about cooperation, international cooperation between researchers and countries along the migratory routes uh, of the spoonbilled uh, sandpiper. Uh, Genia, thank you very much. You look great. Uh, Lena, lovely to see you again. We look forward to, to hearing you tell us about the international cooperation that is so essential for the ongoing conservation of this highly endangered species. Over to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Lena was insisting that I should be properly dressed and wear the spoonbill sandpaper, whatever I we had. We found this cat. <laughs> <laughs> but I will probably uh, better take it to off because it's not very <clears throat> convenient. Uh, anyway, uh, today it's my turn to uh, speak about the Spoonbill Sandpiper work of our team. And I am sharing my screen now to start the presentation. <clears throat> there we are. It's all good. We can see it. Thank you. Yeah, so that's um, it's not an easy task to fit into 15 or 20 minutes, the story of 20 years of uh, collaboration uh, along, the, along the flyway, <clears throat> uh, but I will, I will give it a try. Yeah, so just to remind a little bit, uh, particularly if uh, not everybody has uh, been at the very, uh, at the first two lectures, um, we are speaking about Spoonbill Sandpiper as a charismatic East Asian endemic wader uh, of 35, 40 gram only, migrating six to 8,000 kilometers annually. Nothing to surprise you are in South Africa where all waders which are coming from the Northern Hemisphere are flying much longer distances. But anyway, it was um, declining a lot and was included to the list of 100 most threatened living creatures on the planet and so on and so forth, so forth. But Lena was already telling you about, about this. So just a short reminder why it is so special. And it was never a very common bird, but it used to be within thousands of breeding pairs, but now it is within the first hundreds. So if we think it's about 200 pairs left at the moment, something like that. And you can see the uh, declining graph on on the slide, over 90% in less than 40 years. And it's actually, unfortunately, still declining. And we recently learned about the new declines, which just started happening in the last two years. I'm going to mention it briefly at the end of the presentation. And I'm afraid it's still under risk of extinction in spite of all the many years of our work. <clears throat> so this was the plan of all three presentations. So today, lectures, lecture number three, it's about the flagship role of Spoonbill Sandpiper along the flyway and the efforts, conservation efforts along the flyway. <clears throat> Um, one of the frequently asked questions why you have say, selected a single species uh, for uh, to focus your efforts for many years on the flyaway. It's not a very modern concept. These days people are much more attracted by things like uh, ecosystem services or something which is really important but really complicated for people to understand. Uh, but we think it's, uh, it's still a very well working concept, particularly in Asia. Uh, and we need flagships for the flyway. Uh, it mirrors the stories of many other species, uh, many other conservation issues in the flyway. And giving a good example of cooperation. 
international cooperation. And, and uh, uh, after all, if we can save such a charismatic species from extinction, ex extinction what is all our conservation efforts about? <clears throat> so that's, these were the drivers behind us selecting Fundo Sandpiper as a flagship species for work on the flyway for weighted conservation. Uh, I'm going to mention this subject, a little introduction to the flyway and the threats on the flyway, speak about our Spundo Sand Pass Task Force, some selected news from the key wintering grounds like Myanmar, Bangladesh, China, few words about recent papers published, satellite packing, habitat modeling, and so on. And uh, most recent information, which is not published actually anywhere yet, about the declines. Uh, recent declines and why they may have been happening. <clears throat> so, introducing the flyway, East Asian flyway, um, uh, we believe it's most threatened on the planet. Uh, you can see the eight key uh, planet flyways here, and Chupotka, the place where we keep the breeding grounds, is a uh, red arrow in the middle. Uh, and of course, we all know that we can only save uh, any migratory bird if we uh, coordinate efforts, if we make sure that it is safe along the whole flyway. Otherwise, there is no way how we can uh, save the bird. So we have been focusing for many years, trying to make sure that all the different parts of this Pundo Sandpiper flyway are uh, protected. And this is, this is an old slide, but it's uh, how it looks like when we were starting working on the subject on the flyway some 15 years ago. It was already by that time clear that the Asia Pacific had the highest numbers of uh, threatened uh, water birds. And as far as we have been looking from the Arctic perspective all the time, uh, it was clear that the Arctic birds are declining a lot and waders or shorebirds are declining fastest along, among, among the Arctic shorebirds, and the Asia Pacific region is the area where it is the most pronounced. So it is clear where we are going to focus our activities. Um, declines in East Asia are not new. Already in late 90s, early 2000 years, thanks to um, our colleagues and friends from Australia, we were aware that many waders are declining, and declining was actually. Uh, threatening annual rate, like you can see on these slides, like several percent a year. And it's not only Asia actually where they're declining. So uh, if you look at uh, North American uh, shorebirds, well, I'm using both names, shorebirds and waders, because for, for our collaborators in the old world, we're mainly using uh, waders, but or for the Americans, it's shorebirds, and Australians are saying shorebirds as well. I'm not sure how do you do in, in South Africa, probably waders, right? <clears throat> uh, so you can see on this slide that actually uh, shorebirds in America are declining as well. And so it's actually something really <clears throat> unfavorable in uh, situation for this long distance migrants. So this is paper which is not published. I think by now it's probably already published. And the red color are declining populations for the different flyway among different set, uh, taxonomic groups of, 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 of water birds. Yellow is stable, green is increasing, and gray is unknown. So we can see that waders are declining everywhere quite a lot. And East Asia and Central Asia, they are either the highest proportion of uh, declining uh, populations of shorebirds or the highest proportion of unknown uh, status. Uh, so that's more and more information actually about the difficulties we're having in the station flyway. And here this, I'm going to speak about Spoonbill Sandpiper mainly, but there are three other species at least, which are showing very similar trends. And these are formerly common species, red knot, great knot, and bar tail god with about each of them, we can make a separate presentation. Uh, but still, Spoonbill Sandpiper is kind of a uh, story. Spoonbill Sandpiper story is kind of umbrella story. It's all, most of things which we're going to mention about Spoonbill Sandpiper are true for those other waders as well in East Asia. So, 
uh, repeating what Lena was saying before, three main drivers for declines, uh, habit change in non-breeding grounds. First of all, the interpedal reclamation, hunting, trapping, poisoning in the non-breeding grounds and uh, limitations in survival in the breeding grounds. I'm not going to touch the third one, which Lena was speaking about, uh, about in the previous talks, but the first two were the main drivers for declines of spoonbills, uh, sandpiper and other waders. We now believe, and it's not properly studied yet, that the contaminants, various pollutants, might be a significant, significant driver for uh, declines in numbers through the um, poisoning birds, through the making them reproducting less successfully. But this is a subject which is not properly studied yet anywhere. There are some papers here and there about some examples of uh, contamination of uh, Arctic waders. But so we are, we are going to start a new project, hopefully, finger crossed. Uh, this week we should, next week we should be here if the funding is going to come through. So we're going to start uh, good scale sampling of Arctic waders on the East Asian Flyway, trying to understand the contaminant role. But that will be a story for, for the future. So uh, again, very brief. Uh, habitat change, uh, intertidal habitat change in the Yellow Sea and many other parts of East Asia was dramatic. It was huge scale, particularly late in the 20th century. You can see her on the graph uh, and uh, everywhere actually in many, in many countries. Some European countries were doing quite a lot of uh, intertidal uh, habitat change like the Netherlands. Netherlands is supposed to be probably 20% consist of reclaimed intertidal areas, but they stopped it all. Germany stopped it, Netherlands stopped it, Britain stopped it in kind of 70s, 80s. Uh, but in China and South Korea, it was going huge scale and uh, from 50 to 80% of the Yellow Sea intertidal areas uh, in different countries are reclaimed now. And there were a lot of plans to uh, continue doing that, but luckily, um, to some extent, probably because of also uh, conservation work, including some our contribution, but mostly due to the economic changes in China and mostly due to the fact that uh, the government of uh, Chairman Xi Jinping have understood that uh, they should really pay much more attention to environment. The, uh, at the moment, the reclamation has stopped. Uh, not much is left, but at least not further reclamation is going on. So there is a chance that there will be a little bit habitat left and that uh, the populations of East Asian waders will be able to survive using existing habitat. Hunting, trapping uh, is another threat which is very much underestimated un uh, until very recently. But we have been collecting information about that and encouraging our partners and colleagues in different East Asian countries to collect more and more information about that. And it's actually huge because the tens of millions, tens of millions of birds which are taken in, uh, annually uh, for cons human consumption. Uh, the worst situation was actually in China in uh, the end of 20th century, early 21st century, where according to the evaluation of Professor Ma Ming from UMG in Xinjiang, uh, it was a big business. So the price from the trapper and to the uh, market, to the restaurant table was kind of rising, as you can see on this picture many times. So it was good business and it was a network of illegal trappers and uh, tra people who were bringing it to the consumers uh, along the whole China. But now, again, there are lots of good news. Actually, Chinese government is very very seriously considering it and doing a lot of progress there. It's a bit difficult to evaluate, is it really kind of completely broken, uh, but we can see a lot and a lot of progress, uh, though it is, it is still a problem. There are some uh, things like, looks like minor things, like unintentional bycatch by standing fishing nets in the intertidal areas, but in some places, like you can see this net uh, un unintentionally caught spoonbill sandpiper, 
um, uh, fishing nets which are standing in identified areas uh, may catch a lot of waders. And uh, it's already the study is already going on in China about that. And Overall, it doesn't look like too bad, but in some places, particularly in some Spundus and uh, stopover sites, it was bad. And now hope luckily changing to, to it could be much better. But uh, back to, uh, to, the, uh, to describe a little bit how we are working uh, to uh, save Spundus and Piper's international team. <clears throat> Uh, here you can see it's uh, the name of the team is Spoonbill Center Piper Task Force. Uh, it's uh, it's working under the EFP East Asian Flyway Flyway Partnership. It's a flyway partnership of governments and big conservation NGOs and various conventions along the flyway. And um, we started we started actually 15 years ago, so as a, a bit more than that, as a just a grassroots team. There was not a single big conservation organization behind us. Uh, and gradually the team was developing to become as what is now Fundus of Piper Task Force. <clears throat> and I should mention several names of my friends and colleagues with whom we've been starting all this is Christoph Zuckler. You can see him here on the, on the, on the slide, a German who lives in the United Kingdom. And um, Kashivagistan, Minoru from, from Japan, also Pavel, Yelena, myself, this was the part of the um, core team which started the whole thing in the year 2000. And then in the year 2005, the work in the, in the non-breeding grounds. <clears throat> so our first missions, uh, you can see here, some of us are a bit younger. <clears throat> but now our first missions were to trying to understand what's going on in the non-breeding grounds uh, uh, of Spondo Sandpiper to India, Myanmar, Bangladesh, China, and it was already 15 years ago. Uh, but this first visits uh, and the systematic work which was developing after that uh, to try to encourage local people, local organizations to take Spoonville Sandpiper as a priority species for conservation was started by that time. Here you can see Kashiwagi-san, our Japanese uh, colleague, is uh, on the very left of the uh, slide here. I'm sure many of you are um, great birders and uh, seen lots of shrubbers on the intertidal areas, on the mudflats. So any of you would guess how many spoonbills and pipers here on the site? <coughs> to make the story working faster, I can tell you four, but it was a real challenge actually for us, maybe more. <laughs> When we started working with it, it was a real challenge to find all these small uh, spoonies in the big flocks of redneck stints and some little stints as well on the intertidal or uh, intertidals of Myanmar and Bangladesh, huge areas where there, there's no logistics there, easy to, to make the work easy. But gradually it was somehow working and we're finding more and more spoon percent pipes. So 20 years ago, we, we didn't know most of what is known now. 80% of stopover sites and 90% of winter and areas uh, were not known. We, we knew that they are flying kind of like as shown here on this slide, which was probably produced 20 years ago, something like that, and many question marks. Already in 10 years, uh, we have established the uh, data passport database. And uh, sorry, that's my mother calling. Uh -huh. Um, so you can see lots of dots on the map here, which are showing that uh, actually a lot of spoonbills and pepper are still alive in, uh, by the time, and we are finding them in the towns. So gradually we're learning more and more. And the operation was rising. There are dozens of people working together in different countries. And here you can see the red dots on this map are the activities was happening within one, one year. I think it's 2018 or 2017, uh, so there were survey teams, monitoring teams, uh, conservation activities uh, along the whole flyway. <clears throat> so this is how this Pundus and Piper task work. Already by that time, we were already thinking about uh, various methods of how to find the, 
needle in the haystack and uh, not only uh, uh, surveys trying to find birds uh, in the big flocks of other waders, but also stable isotopes, actually. Um, this study was done 15 years ago, and only by that time we learned that they are in, in Bangladesh, which we knew anyway, but it was already showing the uh, uh, Leju Peninsula in South China, which by that time was not known as a winter inside of Spunda Sandpiper. But later on, in 12 years after that, uh, we were able to, Chinese colleagues find biggest concentration of Spunda Sandpiper there. Stable as a top matters may work <clears throat> as we know. Uh, it's a lot to say about each country. Uh, there are great teams there, there are local NGOs, and there are lots of international support going to Myanmar and Bangladesh, particularly those two countries where the most of wintering grounds of Spundo Sandpiper were discovered in last years. And now lots of conservation work is going on. So there are new protected sites. Um, and um, outreach and hunting mitigation work, alternate, alternative livelihoods, they're really doing the great work offering local people the opportunities to change their livelihood from being illegal hunters to do something else. And uh, uh, only this subject could be a good story for a 15 minutes presentation. <clears throat> uh, in addition to conservation, um, there's a bit of uh, science work, a bit of monitoring work going on, and which is unfortunately showing us that the um, spoon of sandpaper are still, still declining. The Bay of Motama is the biggest concentration of spoonies uh, known, and we are finding they are in first hundreds. In the beginning, now they are less than that. On the, in the left, uh, um, left low, lower corner of the slide, you can see uh, Fiole, the young and enthusiastic leader of the spoon of sandpaper team in Myanmar, really great guy. And they are struggling at the moment a little bit with uh, political changes here, but the, the conservation work is going on anyway. <clears throat> we have a really great and young enthusiastic team. Bangladesh, it's another country where a lot of conservation work is going on. Also hunting mitigation, monitoring, um, a lot of work with local communities and local government, um, arguments to stop some development projects. Uh, uh, creating new protected areas, education of people a lot. Again, I don't have really long time to, to speak about all this. Uh, it's a huge area of Ganges Delta. And Spundils and Piper is selecting the most outer part of Delta. Uh, so it is not easy place to reach. Uh, and those areas where we used to know Bangladesh uh, highest Big numbers of Spunda Sandpiper kind of 30, 40 years ago. There were one island with 200 birds. Uh, it's actually probably 40 years ago. Already 15 years ago, this island doesn't exist. The Ganges have changed its uh, course and it was just water there. But great deal work of, uh, of Siam and uh, Mohammed Faisal, you will see them both on the next slides. They allow us, uh, they allow the team to find the new, the new locations. Sorry, where, where are they? Oh, you can see, yeah, sorry. It's, you can see them. You can see them on the right part of the slide. Siam on the top. He is the uh, assistant coordinator of the Spundu Sandpiper Task Force. Absolutely great and enthusiastic guy who is making now his PhD about uh, waiters in Bangladesh. Uh, he got a position in Cambridge University to do his PhD, and he's doing a lot of good work and coordination action in the whole of Southeast Asia and Mohammed Faisal below. All young and enthusiastic people and they're doing a great job. China is absolutely critical area for Sundos and Piper conservation. And um, we used to know a lot uh, after 15 years of collecting of data in China, but now uh, they have a new team uh, they have its own named uh, China Conservation, Conservation, Conservation Alliance, uh, which is led by Professor Lei Guanchun, a very well recognized professor from Beijing uh, Forestry University and his team, and also supported by uh, Great Foundation, the Mongo Conservation Foundation, uh, the chairman and the engine of this foundation, uh, 
This is Lily Sun. You can see her on the on the slide below. Uh, in China, she's based in Shenzhen, and they're doing absolutely great work to support conservation of uh, spoonbill sandpiper within China and actually outside of China. <clears throat> so I should use a chance to thank Lily and her team very much because they also actually the strongest, currently the strongest supporters of the Chukotka work as well. So China is doing uh, great in many things in economics and in general environment a great progress in environment protection and as we can see now also in spoonbill sandpiper conservation <clears throat> lots of dots on the map are showing uh, the sites with the new uh, known before and new locations where they count spoonbill sandpipers so a lot of good work is going on there and a lot of mitigation of uh, threats which were mentioned above uh, but um, still, Southeast Asia and East Asia is a huge place, and it's very difficult to check every location of concentration of small waders there. Uh, so luckily, we're uh, the privileged to collaborate with a great team from Royal Society for Protection of Birds, uh, with the team of Graham Buchanan, who is one of the world's uh, greatest experts on uh, interpretation of satellite imageries for cons bird conservation purposes. And there's a recent paper published about the modeling of the potential non breeding distribution of spoonies. And um, we learn a lot. There are some 22 new locations, which is worth checking. Well, of course, we should consider that uh, with 90% overall decline, uh, it means actually 90, likely 90% 90 of potentially good sites are also not inhabited by spoonies anymore, but there are still some. And that's a good example how science could help um, conservation. So we are trying to encourage our colleagues from India. Actually, India used to be a good spoonie wintering, uh, wintering area, uh, but then it was lost there for kind of 30 years and recently rediscovered again in West Bengal, but we're pretty sure that it's not only West Bengal, but also the other areas along the coast of uh, Bay of Bengal in uh, East India, where we are trying to encourage our Indian colleagues to search for spoonies using the uh, heavy red modeling, uh, which was just presented above. There's a great expert in waders, Professor Balachandran there, and lots of other people. So we are now, I've recently been twice in India as part of my involvement in CAF. Uh, uh, well, recently, it was a year ago. <laughs> Not much was happening during last year, that's correct. <clears throat> exactly a year ago, I returned from India. Um, anyway, uh, satellite tracking. Again, it's a lot to say here about what what was done and what could be done with smallest uh, satellite tag in the world, which is 1.7 gram only, together with the battery and blue and antenna. You can see an example on the left of the slide here. I still can't understand how, how does it work and how is it possible, but it does work. <clears throat> and here we should thank, first of all, our friend and colleague and scientific advisor of the Spontaneous Piper Task Force, Nigel Clark from uh, BTO from Britain and Professor Rhys Green uh, from Cambridge University, Bas Huge from WWT uh, and uh, many other colleagues from Britain who are really driving force to get the satellite tags and encourage the whole process to happen. So with the good numbers of tags, uh, uh, both in the breeding grounds and in China particularly, we now learn a lot about new locations we have discovered uh, very important potentially North Korean stopovers of spoonbill sandpipers, probably molting, second molting site. Uh, one molting site is in China, as we know, but another molting site uh, is in North Korea, as we believe. And also Indonesia was discovered as a new wintering country. So it's really great technology and we hope it could be continued. So as soon as the uh, uh, we'll have a chance to put tags again. There are lots of plans to do it again. <clears throat> but um, as I mentioned, we recently, the same trend as we saw in Myanmar, we also saw in Chukotka, 
uh, Lena was showing this slide before the with as a result of head starting was already starting increasing in numbers but then suddenly in the last two years we have a decrease of 20 30 percent which is a lot and we don't fully understand what's going on but there are several hypotheses why it may be happening some unfavorable conditions so the key stopovers uh, possibly north korean issues possibly climate change weather changes on, on the flyway possibly still hunting going on uh, and we increasingly learned that it's actually quite a lot of shooting of waders, particularly small waders, in some parts of the Russian Far East, um, in places like Kamchatka and Sakhalin. Uh, that's a study which is going on for the last two years. And fortunately, no time to, to speak more about more detail about it. Um, maybe these are pollutants, uh, maybe it's cumulative effects of all those stressors, something else toxic on the flyway, we don't know. But it's a lot of a lot of things which could, we could try to focus in our conservation studies. Hopefully, this decline will be not as uh, continuous as it was before. Otherwise, the species is getting in serious trouble in nearest years again. Uh, North Korea is really the most difficult country of the flyway because you simply can get there. Luckily, there are some satellite imagers which can give a very good impression about what's going on there, and we can see it's a lot of habitat change. That's the only country where reclamation is still going on. Uh, North Korea had the lowest percentage of reclaimed habitat so far in the Yellow Sea. It was kind of the uh, best uh, untouched part of it in terms of uh, how safe the intertidal areas are. And like that. But unfortunately, it's not there anymore. It's developing and um, we presume that it's connected to the Chinese development companies who have the technology. But anyway, so we, we should find a way how we can uh, for, uh, build a dialogue with the government of North Korea, uh, hopefully in collaboration with our Chinese uh, colleagues, try to address this threat, which is really a challenge. <clears throat> climate change. Um, everybody is thinking about climate change in the, in the Arctic. We know that the Beringian region uh, where Chukotka is, uh, Chukotka and Alaska is, is the, the most warming part of the uh, Arctic globally. Uh, but when you look in much more detail in that, we find out that uh, our area of Spundal San is still does exist, which is exactly where this arrow is, is actually not warming, warming in, uh, not warming in terms of at least uh, ocean water. And we don't have such a great data for the terrestrial temperatures, but we know they correlate to each other. And we know that habitat change in Alaska, on Alaska side, Lena did mention our visit to Alaska uh, several years ago, and it have been happening in the good areas for potential Spundel San Papa habitat here in the Kotzebue Sound, which is the most warming side. And you can see how strong changes could happen on the uh, Crowberry um, uh, Spitz, uh, where Spundus and could potentially be. So, so far it's not happening in Chukotka. It's a tiny, small spot of the coast of Chukotka. It is not happening. And luckily Spundus and Pipers do bleed there. Because if it will start happening fast, it will be it will change the habitat in probably 20, 30 years to the condition where it will be very hard for spoonies to breed. But so far it's not happening. <clears throat> so something definitely to study here more. So when you try to put all this uh, uh, spoony conservation effort to the theoretical population curve, uh, recovery curve of a species which was developed by RSPB, <clears throat> uh, until two years ago, it all looks very not, uh, all very promising. So we we were have a stage of diagnosis. We were testing the solutions. Then we were deploying the solutions through the head starting and a lot of conservation work in the non breeding grounds. And it was supposed to go up, but at the moment something is probably going not according to the theory. <laughs> so we'll probably have another wave of this. Uh, graph, but this we can only we'll be able to say later about that. <clears throat> so
So I would like to use another chance to thank the uh, team because what I'm presenting here is actually done on behalf, uh, well, Len and I, or by Len and I, on behalf of the big team with lots of collaborators, our friends and colleagues from Fundus Arata Task Force. I, I put selected names in the beginning of my presentation and, and as a contributor to this talk. But here you can see an example of international team working in Myanmar. It should be Lena somewhere there. Ah, oh, yeah, I can see her in the middle. And actually, uh, the work is still going on. The work in the breeding grounds and the non-breeding grounds. And we have a, a practice of uh, inviting and integrating volunteers uh, from various parts of the world. So I can see the reason why somebody who is interested to and have time and opportunity to join the um, conservation team somewhere on the East Asian flyway for Spunda Sandpiper, why somebody from South Africa could have joined, actually, please think about it. As soon as the world will be open again, <laughs> as soon as we'll be able to start our international collaborative projects in the breeding grounds and non-breeding grounds, I hope we can have great international uh, teams in the field again. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm afraid it was a little longer than 15 minutes. But thank you. Thank yeah. you very much, Enya. Um, no, no problem um, going into injury time, as, uh, as Les is, is usually telling us. Um, a fascinating story. And uh, I think that we've really, really been privileged to um, have the two of you speak to us over the last three uh, citizen science hours about this fascinating story. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much indeed. I'm not sure how much uh, time we still have at our disposal, um, but I just have one question from Sue Gi. Uh, she asks, how important are the Manpo wetlands in Hong Kong for Spoonbill sandpipers in terms of, uh, of migratory stopover of feeding grounds? Uh, my pool in Hong Kong is a mm, great place, but it's very small. It's used to have some spoonies on the migration regularly before, but less now. There's still occasionally some, uh, but also the uh, it's it's a case that my pool is changing, actually. It's overgrowing by mangroves at the moment, and they are... They're managing it quite well. It's probably one of the best managed uh, intertidal areas in, uh, in the whole of East Asia. But uh, the issue is also that uh, my po is muddy and it's actually getting more muddy because of the deposits of, of the river uh, coming there. And Spoonbill Sandpiper prefer more outer parts of mud path. They prefer more, more combination of sandy, sandy muddy thing outer speeds, outer parts of Delta. So uh, even theoretically, my po is not the best habitat. Uh, so if you, well, the best place in China to see the Spoonbill Sandpiper is the Jiangsu, Southern Jiangsu province. There are several locations, kind of two, three hours drive from Shanghai. Its uh, area changed a lot. It's really hugely changed. There's hardly much wide nature left. It's all, Human change, but there are still mudflats and there are still lots of birds, lots of uh, Normans, green shanks, Pundil sandpipers, and luckily it's now protected. It's now the World Heritage Site. So again, we have to thank the government of China and uh, lots of enthusiasts in China, NGOs in China, and scientists in China who have been doing a great job to, to, to protect this area. Thanks very much, Enya. Um, one further uh, question from Jonathan. He just says, if uh, if a spoonful sandpipe is all breed in a in a in a rather small area, why do some overwinter in China but others further away in Bangladesh and India? Are there any known reasons for that? Well, the small area uh, in South Chukotka is what is left. Actually, there are little bits here and there, so there are little bits and then central part of Chukotka, which we still know where places where the two free pairs or something like that. Um, in the north Chukotka, we don't know any left, but there are probably still some. Because Chukotka, well, we know Chukotka not too bad, but it's a huge area. So probably still, we, we hope 
we hope there are still some areas which we don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, so far, uh, the genetic analysis was showing that it's kind of uniform thing. There are no uh, segregation of Northern Chukotka and Southern Chukotka spoonies, which may winter in different sites. So they all somehow mix. And uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, individually marked birds uh, also mixing and showing that there is, there is some tendency of birds from one part of even surroundings of Minor Pilgina going to more to say Bangladesh or going to South China, but we still don't know enough about that. It's still a, a lot to learn, but overall they all, what is left, they all mixing in the range which we know and that's from Bangladesh or even in India to southern China. Thank you. Thank you for that. <coughs> yeah, I, I, I wish that we could continue, continue our discussions for, for another hour. Um, it's been fascinating uh, hearing the story about the Spoonbill Sandpiper. Thank you very much for spending time with us um, to our, both our speakers this evening. To Dita, thanks for a fascinating and uh, 